securing our foster parent license in order to bring a school-aged boy into our family to adopt. We have gone through trauma-focused training, have learned the ups and downs that foster children face, and in general have learned that most foster children come out of poverty. We've had to educate ourselves on what our child has likely experienced and the ways in which these experiences can be overcome. And it has taught us something. The rags to riches story we hold dear in America is for the most part a myth. I want to enlighten you to what the stress caused by poverty does to a developing child's brain. According to the Center of Developing Child at Harvard University, there are three types of stress that children deal with. So the first is positive stress, and it's a very important part of development. I went through this this last weekend with my three-year-old when we went to a birthday party and she discovered that she was not going to be the child that was opening up the presents. <laughs> it was horrific for her. This is how children learn how to cope with their surroundings and with others' actions and then deal with their own emotions and disappointments. So positive stress is important in skills development and will eventually translate into adulthood and dealing with those stresses and with the various aspects of adult life. So the second type of stress that the center identifies is tolerable stress, which occurs in more severe cases. So we're talking about the death of a beloved grandparent, a natural disaster such as a flood or a tornado, or a car accident. But the presence of a loving adult mitigates the impact that the stress has on the child. The last type of stress identified is toxic stress. So this is comprised of any stress of a chronic nature that is unrelenting exposure to a stressful environment such as neglect, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, witness to violence, and poverty. A major factor of toxic stress is a lack of adequate adult support to mitigate the stress. So when we're stressed, our brain tells our adrenal glands to produce adrenaline and cortisol. Cortisol binds to receptors in our brain neurons, which causes the cells to allow in more calcium. The calcium al allows the neurons to fire rapidly and respond to the stress. Prolonged exposure to excess calcium in your neurons can excite your brain cells to death. So certain areas of your brain can actually start to die. Well, the connections can die. Cortisol also heightens the memories we currently make. And this makes sense because whenever you've experienced a really traumatic event, you can remember in great detail what happened during the event. And this makes it even easier to relive the experience rather than to just revisit it in a memory, such as what would happen in PTSD. Under stress, our hippocampus works to link the memory to our object of fear. So think back to Psychology 101 and Pavlov's dogs where they would ring a bell and the dog would salivate, anticipating that treat. In traumatized children, triggers develop around smells, sights, memories, and emotions that at times can scarcely resemble the original trauma. So they go from taking a trigger to being very specific, such as an angry word, to very general, maybe just an angry look, to even just an anxiety disorder. No one has to be angry around them, they're just in a very anxious mood. And so this cortisol level is really high in their brain all the time. So imagine that fear is present every day. The brain will no longer find the development of executive function and self-regulation skills to be important. And those are the skills that that positive stress helps to develop. So these skills include impulse control, ability to focus, recognition of emotion and empathy, long-term planning, following instructions, and learning. So when the brain is steeped in cortisol on a routine basis, it becomes wired to mainly identify, process, and retain information that might help survive the daily threats and sources of fear. So if you're a child when these daily threats are present, your brain grows in such a way as to place a premium on fear, recognition, and response at the expense of learning and peer interactions, resulting in a socially awkward child who is behind in school. <clears throat> so the ways our brain develops is we actually develop from the base of our brain up to the top. And the processes go, at the base of the brain you have emotion. So you're dealing with empathy, recognizing emotions. Then you go up into the learning. So this is only if your basic needs are met that you go into 
the learning aspect of the brain. Once you've conquered that, then you go up to the top where you make decision making and critical thinking skills. And this is where you learn to do impulse control. You learn to plan all those things. So if you have a child who is constantly in fear and they're never reaching past this emotional point, they're not going to be able to make skills that will help them in their adult life. So fears from neglect, abuse, and poverty, they're treated differently in your brain than your typical childhood fears. So fears of the dark, strangers, your separation from mommy, or in my three-year-old's case, fire alarms that blink, and robotic vacuums, they can all be overcome with age and with the ability to reason out your fears. And they were created in the first place by just an overactive imagination. However, learned fears that stem from abuse and poverty are extremely hard to erase. So a learned fear is your fear of something that's hot. So do you think as an adult you could ever reach out and touch a red hot piece of metal? No, you're not gonna do that. Why, because every time you've touched something hot, you have the same consequences, you get burned. So it's very hard to unlearn a learned memory. So what does this have to do with poverty? Well, kids are sponges, and they pick up on our habits, our words, our mannerisms, and yes, they pick up on our stress, too. In a 2012 Forbes article entitled, How Parents' Stress Can Hurt a Child from the Inside Out, Alice Walton leads us through a maze of research to point out that it's not always love that our children want, they want a calming presence free from stress and a little bit of adult time, which is something that any adult can give to a child, not just a parent. When parents are stressed, we know that they have less patience and when they resort to yelling and hitting rather than calm explanations. Common adult responses to stress are zoning out in the form of alcohol, TV, drugs, video games, or reading. So a stressed parent interacts less with their children, too, because let's face it, parenting is stressful. In our country, one of our core social beliefs is that anyone can rise from rags to riches. This is true to the extent that an individual possesses those strong executive function and self-regulation skills that we talked about earlier. The National Scientific Council on the Developing Child outlines in Working Paper 13, published earlier this year, that the number one factor of resiliency in children is not, as commonly believed, some random inherited trait that they have, but is instead the result of, and I quote, at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or other adult. So the work paper goes on to explain that these executive function and self-regulation skills must be developed in order for the child to function as a normal member of society. And that makes sense, right? If a young adult they can't focus, how can they apply for college? How can they hold down a job, maintain a romantic relationship, or even plan to prevent an unwanted pregnancy? What sort of parent does such a child become without these skills? Is it too far to stretch the imagination and imagine that this becomes a cycle in our poverty, in our society? It isn't, and it has a name. It's called generational poverty, and it's where no one in the family has ever existed outside of the pan outside of poverty from the child all the way up to the grandparent. Nobody knows what it's like to not live in poverty. I'm sad that our potential child will have so much to overcome in order to lead a normal life. I wanted to let you understand, fellow Toastmasters, what children in poverty face. Perhaps you can find time to become a big brother or sister. Perhaps you will remember the challenges next time you vote on extending benefits that it would alleviate the strain on poverty of parents of children, even if you think the parents don't deserve it. A healthy society depends upon the health of its next generation.